Can a backslider be restored? If so, what are the requirements for restoration? Dr. David K. Bernard explains in this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, a podcast dedicated to helping modern-day believers live out the teachings of the first century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. Thank you for joining us for this episode. The Old Testament makes reference to something called backsliding. And anybody who's been around the Apostolic Pentecostal Church for any length of time knows that we have picked that term up. What do we mean, though? Can you explain maybe to the uninitiated what apostolics mean when they describe somebody as a backslider? And more importantly, the reason why we're even asking this question is, can a person who has backslid, can they be restored? The short answer is yes, a person who has backslidden can be restored. Now, yes, as you point out, the term backslider is kind of like a Pentecostal term or used by other conservative groups as well. It really comes from the Old Testament, not the New Testament. But we use it to mean someone who was once an active part of the church, saved. So we would understand that to mean baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, coming faithfully to church. And then for whatever reason, they drop out of church. They're not coming anymore. They're not living the Christian life. They're not paying their tithes generally. Um, They're not following some teachings, whether it be modesty of dress or sexual morality. Uh, they're, They're just living a sinful life. So they are once living a holy life, coming to church faithfully, born again, now they're not coming to church and they're living a sinful life. So we call that backslidden. Now, I, we don't believe the so-called once saved, always saved. And we, I think we discussed that in an earlier podcast. So if someone turns up, you know, we, we're saved by grace through faith. But faith is a relationship. It's a way of life. Uh, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God to salvation, everyone who believes And then verse 17 says, they'll go from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. So we believe uh, faith is a way of life. As long as you're continuing to walk by faith, you should have assurance of salvation, confidence in your salvation. Yes, you're saved, even though you're not perfect. And if you sin, you repent, you confess it, and God forgives you. You continue on in your holy life. You are saved. You are continually saved in a condition of salvation. But if you deliberately walk away from God, rejecting the life of faith, then you step out of faith. No, you're not saved. And when the Lord comes, if you're in that condition, whether it's by death or the rapture, uh, you won't be ready because you have, you've stepped away from God. You've come out of that relationship of faith. You're not living for God. So the question becomes, well, what if somebody is in that condition, can they come back? And the answer is yes. Now, there are some passages in the book of Hebrews that are very, very strong warnings against backsliders that would indicate, well, maybe no, you can't. But those are what are what we would call apostasy. Apostasy is more than backsliding. Apostasy is denying the faith uh, and denying the reality of the faith. You have to understand the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians. It was warning them. Some were Uh, thinking or maybe even going back to Old Testament sacrifices. And the writer of Hebrews was saying, if you turn away from Christ and try to go back to the old covenant ceremonies for your salvation, you can't be saved because Jesus is the only Savior. The Old Testament was pointing toward Christ. The ceremonies, ceremonial law and the types have been fulfilled in Christ. So your salvation is in Christ. If you deny Christ, deny that he's a savior and try to be saved through through uh, the sacrificial system of the temple, then you can't be saved. Even then, I don't think he's saying, if you wake up, realize your error, repent and call out to Jesus Christ for help. No, you can't be saved. He's saying, once you've known Jesus and you've been born again, and then you come to the point saying, I deny Jesus, I reject Jesus, I'm going to be a Buddhist, or I'm going to be a, 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 non, a, a Jew, or I'm going to be an atheist, well, then you can't be saved like that. Uh, so that's why the strong warning. 
Then there's also the, the so-called unpardonable sin, which I think I've also referenced. And that, again, is not that you get to a point where God refuses to forgive you. It's you get to the point where you've rejected the Lord, you've rejected the work of the Spirit, having truly known the work of the Spirit, to deny it, to say it's nothing, to say it's of the devil, say it's psychological, and reject, reject, reject. You get to a point where you've hardened your heart. God hasn't cut you off, but you've cut God off. And even when God, if he were to try to talk to you or if other people would pray for you and ask God to move upon you, you can't even recognize that. And let me just give you a very quick statement here. Many people fear they've committed the unpardonable sin. Well, if you are concerned about it, to me, that is proof you haven't gotten to that point. Because if you had gotten to that point, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't even believe. You wouldn't. So if you have a conscience, if you have conviction, if you have a desire to be saved, to me, that shows you're still capable of experiencing God's grace. So no, it would be a trick of the devil to say you've committed the unpardonable sin. So with, with those exceptions, in, in general, we say, yes, of course, a backsider can be restored. And there are many, many, many passages, but over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, God caused his people repent not, and con- turn to me, not just people who've never known God, but to his own people. And you have the the well-known story in the Gospel of Luke of the prodigal son or the lost son. The whole story shows about someone who was in the father's house, who walked away, who lost the inheritance, but yet repents, comes back, and and is restored. So that's a great example. Uh, Another statement, Jesus, uh, the, the apostle Peter asked Jesus when he was talking about forgiveness, you know, how many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? And so he tried to think of well, an exaggerated number, seven times, you know, the number of perfection. Surely that would be enough. And Jesus answered, no, 70 times seven. And he wasn't meaning 490. He was meaning as long as your brother sincerely repents, forgive him. Well, if Jesus is telling us to do that, obviously God would do no less. He will forgive us. Let me give you some pa- a scripture here. James 5, 19 through 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So this is not just talking about a momentary sin, but someone who goes away from the truth. But if you're able to convert him and restore and bring him back, yes, you saved his soul. And then even thinking of daily sins or or we, we should live a whole life every day. But what I mean is not someone who's just going to openly backslid in life for a, a length of time, but even if you realize at a certain time I've sinned, well, forgiveness is available. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So based, based on these passages and many others, yes, whether it's a sin of the moment or going back into a sinful life over a period of time, which we would say is backslidden. Either way, when a person repents, they can be restored. Now, maybe the the, the question would be, well, what, what has to happen? Uh, do they need to be baptized again? Do they need to receive the Holy Ghost again? What needs to happen? Well, let me put it like this. We believe that when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and of course, that's assuming you, you truly have faith and you truly repented. That's a one-time experience. Now, if you're baptized as a baby, we don't really consider that a valid baptism. Or it could be sometimes people are baptized as small children. Looking back on it, they don't even remember it. They question whether they just did it out of peer pressure. Well, there might be a case there that they should be baptized. Uh, but But just because you're baptized as a child or you're baptized as a new convert that didn't have a full understanding of holiness, well, everybody's like that. The, the main thing, if at the time you're baptized, there was true faith in Jesus Christ and there was a true repentance of surrendering to the Lord as far as what you knew, then God accepted that. That is a one time. And then when you receive the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues as the initial sign. So we call that being born again. Well, you don't have to be born again again. Okay. So once you're born again, you're born again. So it's like a child born into the family. Yes, as that child grows up, uh, that child could walk away from their family, reject their family, never come back for holidays, and uh, be excluded from their parents' will. 
And so even though they're a child, they're disinherited. They don't enjoy the fellowship and they don't enjoy the inheritance, but they're still the child. So someone that's been born again, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, they're always a child. That doesn't mean they're automatically saved. They can walk away from their relationship and lose the benefits of the present relationship or the future inheritance. But when they come back, they don't have to be made a child again. So I would rather say they need to be restored to their original experience. And how are you restored? Well, you have to have a genuine repentance. And typically, we would pray with a person until they speak in tongues again. Although there's not a biblical statement regarding the backslider like that, we would say if you spoke in tongues before, we want to pray until there's a renewing where that same level of faith and surrender operates again. So we would highly encourage them to keep praying until you once again have that liberty and that anointing. But as far as technically, do you have to be baptized in Jesus name again? No. Do you have to be baptized with the Holy Ghost again? No. You have to be renewed to your previous experience, restored to your previous experience. And so the basic avenue that for that is a genuine repentance. Now I can give you scripture for this. Uh, in Acts chapter eight, Philip went and preached to the Samaritans. They believed they were baptized, so obviously they repented. Then Peter and John came and laid hands on them. They received the Holy Spirit. There was a miraculous sign, which we know from other texts had to be speaking in tongues. Well, Simon the sorcerer, he was a magician, and he believed at least to the point that he was baptized. So either it was a genuine repentance or at least Philip thought it was a genuine repentance. But when he saw the miracle of Peter and John laying hands on the people and then receiving the Holy Ghost, he said, I want to buy that power so that I could go lay hands on people and they start speaking in tongues. You know, can, can, I would like to purchase that. Well, Peter rebuked him harshly and said, you're in danger of hell. Repent of your wickedness. But interestingly, he didn't say, and you need to be baptized again. So he said, you need to repent again. But he didn't say you need to be baptized again. So that would be one practical example that you don't find in the New Testament that once somebody has been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, that they would need to be baptized a second time um, to restore them. But, uh, and, and that's why I, I do say when people go to the Holy Land, you know, and they want to be baptized in the Jordan River, wait a minute, if you're truly baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you don't need to be baptized again. Now, if you want to have a symbolic commemoration you can, but it has no spiritual significance. It's not the Jordan River, and it's not the water. It's certainly not the same water. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I would discourage people from being baptized again unless, looking back, they truly felt there wasn't repentance to start with or wasn't faith to start with. Um, so our message would be one of great encouragement. Uh, anyone who strayed from God, whether it's one moment of sin or whether it's going growing cold in your heart and maybe nobody really knows it but you or whether you have just openly walked away from God into an, uh, an openly sinful lifestyle what you'll find is God still loves God still cares God is a merciful and if you'll come back to where you left him and you'll truly repent and ask to be renewed to your original faith and original experience God is gracious he will forgive you and you can and will be restored Thank you for listening to this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We also appreciate it when you share Apostolic Life in the 21st Century with a friend or family member. And make plans to join us again next time as we look at how the Bible applies to everyday life.